Welcome. My name is Will Torres. This is Application Week, Connecting the Dots. Each day this week, we've been focusing on different pieces of the application. And so um, we navigated through what are the different parts. Uh, we talked about testing, transcripts, academics. Yesterday, we talked a lot about letters of recommendation and reference, tips <clears throat> for both folks applying as well as recommenders. Today, we're going to put those dots together. And I'm really excited about this because one of the things that I learned um, over my career as an admissions professional is that no single part of the application, like, you know, they all belong together. Together, they're the things that help us really understand who you are. So it's not about the dot specifically, but what is that picture? What is that constellation? If you think about those dots as stars, right? Each one of those sections is an area for you to shine. What is the constellation that is drawn when we step back and look at all of those pieces together? And so I'm joined today. We are going to start with panelist introductions. I'm so excited. I don't really get to do a lot of panels with Stephanie, so you can tell where my energy is. We'll talk about the holistic review process. Then we'll, we'll start with a moderated Q&A, and then we'll turn to the Q&A box. We'll be infusing your questions all the way through. So if you see questions that you are particularly inspired by or that resonate with you, go ahead and click that thumbs up button. That will upvote that question and help it uh, get to the top of the list. All right, so with that, um, Stephanie. Yes. With a brief introduction, and what is one of your life goals? Ooh, <laughs> putting me on the spot. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Stephanie Whitland. I am one of the admissions officers at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and I'm delighted today to join Will in this session. Will, I love how you described it as a constellation. I, I made note of that because it very much does describe how each element is intertwined and how together it creates something. So I love that. Um, <clears throat> One of my life goals, well, I have a son now, um, he's eight, so I've had him for a few years, but um, I think for me, the most, I, I've always been a curious person and someone who seeks to understand, and my life goal is to make sure that he and myself are able to explore and learn more about the world, and I think that's really important from a perspective of a child growing up and exploring and um, being curious and being aware and being open-minded, so. Okay, my heart just kind of exploded for a little bit. That is <laughs> such a heartfelt and authentic response to that answer. And it just kind of, yes, I am feeling that I'm here to support you all the way through. <laughs> and so as we go through, like think about your dreams, think about your life goals for everybody out there. Think about like dream big and how can business school help you reach those dreams? And I think that's one of those things that I like to encourage folks to think about. Your career infuses so much of who you are. So it's things about curiosity, you know, who are the people in your life? It might be your son, right? Mm -hmm. And how are you going to live a meaningful, constructive life that when you look back on, you can be proud of. Mm -hmm. And so if business school is part of that path, we are here to help guide you along it. And so to just to set a little bit of a foundation about what we're going to cover, it's going to be both at that high level and we'll go ahead and dig into the little bits too. <laughs> so at the GSB, we're looking for things in three general buckets, intellectual vitality, demonstrated leadership potential, and personal qualities and contributions. These are background agnostic, meaning that we find them anywhere in your life from all different walks of life any career, kind of school background, there are so many ways to show these three qualities and different types of qualities within them. And we celebrate and recognize wherever they come up for you. They're also context dependent. So we know if you are earlier in your career versus later, there's gonna be a different set of opportunities and that's normal. And we're taking that into account as we're reading your application. Your application consists of a bunch of different sections, these stars that I referred to earlier. And it's through these that we get that picture of who you are. Yes, it's an imperfect picture because you are so much more than what's gonna be contained on those pages. But 
through this application, we're trying to understand who you are, how you're gonna show up in our classrooms and in our community. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And then Stephanie, we are going to spend um, a good amount of time just talking about the application. So from your, from where you sit, what does a strong application look like? Mm. Well, there is no one formula for, for what strong looks like. Um, certainly for us who are evaluating candidates, we are taking a holistic approach, which is why this is a, a great session on connecting the dots. It's being able to see evidence throughout the application where there's mm -hmm. parts that sort of sparkle or show up in terms of someone's impact that they've had or the ways in which they've been intellectually engaged. Um, so it's, it's, it's not um, a specific thing. And I think that's what makes it so hard to explain. Um, but we certainly more than anything are looking to learn about you. So strong applications are those people or those candidates who can really convey who they are as a person and what they've done in a you know concise way uh, and use all parts of the application to demonstrate those qualities. Yeah, I, I love, you mentioned evidence at the beginning and I think that's one of those pieces that if you think about that analogy of that picture that I just showed earlier where each part of the application was a different part of a greater picture, mm -hmm. um, it's those evidence pieces that really adds clarity and definition to those sections and helps us understand, okay, this is how this pieces together. Um, would you say that like kind of resonates? Does that sound? Yeah, actually I'll use an example because I think people are so um, focused on, they see one of our criteria is intellectual vitality and you may um, uh, initially drive to, oh, that means they're looking at my GMAT and my um, GRE or GPAs. So all of that. So whether it was a test score or GPA. And while that certainly is part of intellectual vitality, uh, as someone who's evaluating applications, I'm looking for it all over the place. And, and a great example is like, it could, it could come up in a letter of recommendation where the recommender is indicating that this particular individual saw a need to develop a new tool that would help improve um, a system or project. And as a result, they then um, taught others, but they learned it on their own and then they applied it to what they were doing. And if that isn't intellectual vitality, I don't know what is. So it's like, you're looking for places where you see someone who's just intellectually curious, who is engaged, they have a willingness to learn, they want to share mm. that with others. And I think um, it is so much more than just a GPA or a, a test score. And so I want people to really understand that as we read that, I see that and I'm like, wow, that that's strong evidence of someone's intellectual vitality. They took something above and beyond and then they they grew it and being able to really see that curiosity come through um, is, is fascinating, so. Yeah, look, so all of these things could come up in different ways. Are there any unexpected places as well? You gave one example um, for us to think broadly about where things could come up. I know sometimes kind of staying on the theme of intellectual vitality, I've seen it come up in the background um, question where we're asking about a time in the last few years where your background has influenced your participation in something. Um, and sometimes even the way folks engage with who they are, that level of self-awareness and connection to the world around them, there is a level of intellectual vitality there as well. Like there's so many types of intellect, mm. like um, <clears throat> emotional intelligence, people intelligence, tactical. Sometimes people are like really good and like visualizing things. So I think there's so many different ways to show even different types of intelligence. Yeah. And so just lean into the things that feel natural and resonate for you. Yeah. So that's my, my thing. Yeah. I mean, overarching to, while we've already kind of addressed the question, a, a strong application is just really going to convey who you are, right? And so to the extent that you can do that, you're, you're putting your best foot forward. So we want to see all elements of you as a person. 
Yeah. So your perfect segue and folks in the Q and A box are already beating me to okay. like that next question that I was I wanted us to to unpack a little bit. So. I, we, I've been using the analogy of here's a, a bigger picture and the application shows different parts. We use the example of a constellation with different stars. And so there's also a number of questions about, do these have to connect? Um, you know, do I have to make sure things resonate across or can things be standalone? Um, what, let's, let's, let's go there, let's talk about how do we think about the sections in concert with each other? Because even the theme of today's Q and our this panel is like connecting the dots. So, right. What, any, any thoughts that you have? Let's let's go. Let's go there. Um, I, I don't think it needs to be as as perfectly woven together as you think it may. There might be elements of your life that are an important piece of who you are, but don't necessarily show up in other places. Um, I think. There certainly wants to be, I wanna see a theme of what's important to you, um, what you value. And I imagine that those are gonna show up in different ways throughout the application. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I can sort of convey as it relates to um, describing. So for example, you, you said before how there might be something in the background and perspective that gives us some idea about um, how the life they've lived and the experiences they've had have um, impacted the way that they view the world or even how they present in the workplace. And we might see some small evidence of that and then also notice that a recommender or in your LORs or even in your essays that you elaborate more on that and then that becomes another piece of who you are and we get to see that elsewhere. But I don't think we're necessarily looking to make that to tie a bow. Um, I think uh, everyone is so multifaceted. Mm -hmm. taking all the components and then building the picture of who you are and you may be a different person in different contexts and bring different things to different communities that you're involved with. Yeah sorry my eyes just lit up as you were talking about how you might live in different communities <clears throat> be a different individual knowing that for many folks there might be some element of code switching where maybe the language or the presence you know you might show up differently at work than you do at home but that doesn't mean that's still you, right? Yeah. Those are still elements and manifestations of who you are. So even if, and I've learned this over time too, it's like, even if things might seem like disjointed, you as an individual, because you're the one going through them, they, they are connected. And so I wouldn't um, have anybody out there feel worried that things don't always seem like, as you said, tied into a perfect bow, but really as you dig deeper and think about, okay, you as an individual, like as you center yourself, you are the connector. So what is it about you that's bringing those things together? Because at some level, yeah, they're going to be connected yeah. through you. So yeah. I think that's, yeah. that's one and of those things. I think being able to, to look at yourself as more than the one dimensional paper mm -hmm. screen that you're, um, I think, uh, we all are aware that individuals, human beings are complex. And so there's so many different um, facets that we're going to learn about. And I think that what that's what makes our application so robust and that we give candidates the opportunity to demonstrate all of those in many different places on the application. All right. So we're, there is a question in the Q and A box, Stephanie. It has three times the number of upvotes as everybody okay. else, as any other question. So let's go there because also, I all, I'm a big fan of starting with here's things to watch out for, and then here's how to address them. So maybe if we can start with like what were and any examples that we've seen of definite like quote unquote not to dos, or as I like to think of them, areas of opportunity, and then you know, afterwards, but we can talk about like, all right, now let's how to beef things like that up. So <laughs> any red flags for you? I mean, the most obvious um, not to do or definite not to do is to not answer the questions that we ask of you, right? Like, we literally do want you to take the time and answer the prompts that we have provided for you. Um, there's reason and meaning behind what we ask. And so we're trying to capture that information. 
Um, I mean, at an overarching, just, you know, following instructions um, and, and really putting your best foot forward and really answering the prompts as they're provided. Yeah, there's been times I read essays and, and I'd finish and I'm like, I actually don't know what matters to you. <laughs> and so that, I, I think that's like, for me, the epitome of what you were saying right now. Um, yeah. There's this other level of that too, not just the question and prompt itself, but as you look at the application, like every blank spot's an opportunity. Optional, yes, that, is, you, that doesn't mean you have to use it, but when we're asking you in your employment or work history section, um, information about those roles, sometimes I, I see people leave those blank and then the application mm -hmm. itself looks very sparse. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not enough meat in the resume to help cover that. So as you're thinking about both, like every element as, you know, a different angle on who you are, I think that's one of those, not complete like red flags, but something for you to think about as you're, you're doing this, like um, just that completeness and, and effort element. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I do, we um, ask folks to submit a resume, but there's also the employment section and we ask people to fill that out. And um, it is, if you see what I would say is a thinner application where some of those places are not filled out, it does beg the question of the amount of effort you put into it. Um, because certainly while we can see what you've done on your resume, we provide those other um, places on the application for you to really articulate things more clearly. And it's helpful to us. We don't ask it just to fill the space. We genuinely have um, a desire and understanding. And so um, be sure that you are um, putting your best foot forward and, and not giving us any instance where we have to think, hmm, what kind of effort or commitment did they have to this process? Yeah, outside of the optional questions, because those are optional, like truly, truly, yes, truly, truly Yes, optional. of course, right. We've admitted people who have filled all of them out. We've admitted people who have left them all blank. So know that truly yeah. optional. And, and, and I think that's one in. of the questions that comes up. It, probably, I thought that might be the top line question would have to answer. So yes, let me be First, please reiterate that if we say it is optional, it is genuinely optional. Um, and we only want you to include something if you feel like it's compelling, that it provides you with another opportunity to share something that you may not have been able to communicate elsewhere in the application. But we absolutely do not look or put anyone at a disadvantage if, for example, you do not fill out the optional impact questions or those short answers. So I could not have planted a better segue for the next top question here. We're talking a lot about connecting the dots. Here's some optional spaces. So, and, and I think this like works perfectly with today's topic. Um, so this is a question from Adavan. How do you see successful applicants use the optional essays? Do they answer all of them present um, to provide as many pieces as possible or answer fewer to better highlight the important aspects? Like, when might be a time um, to, to use those impact questions? Any, let's, let, let's shed some light there. Yeah, there's so many ways that they can be used and I've seen it done in many ways and there's no one right way to do it. Um, Oftentimes the impact um, prompts can be a great opportunity for you to elaborate on a particular extracurricular or activity or community organization you are a part of and to talk a little bit about maybe the impact you had. And again, I want people to understand that the impact doesn't have to be at a large scale. It can also be the impact you've had with a mentee or as you were tutoring or coaching one individual and helped support that person as they were navigating their either educational journey or even career journey. So um, I see the impact essays as a nice way to elaborate on some of the things you have done and maybe have um, glo not glossed over, but weren't able to elaborate as much on mm -hmm. elsewhere in the application. It's also nice to see, you know, there might be something on your resume that you've indicated that you're really proud of because it was a, um, 
a, a big success or accomplishment. And then to be able to take one piece or component of that and really give us a little bit more meat. So it's all about getting um, evidence. So, you know, we are evidence-based in terms of how we evaluate. We wanna see what you've done. And I do believe that the impact um, prompts give us that opportunity to, to step a little bit smaller. They're like snippets, you know, it's not something that you necessarily need to incorporate into an essay, but they can be small vignettes of ways in which Ooh. and most impactful. <laughs> Ooh, I'm, I'm about to start using small vignettes. That's, <laughs> no, I, just I love that. Um, yeah, because like you're saying, your resume says what, right? Oftentimes that's how the, a resume is structured. Yeah. Like, this is what I did, this is what I did. But that often misses, we don't have enough space to talk about the how, right? right? If you're thinking about some of those leadership competencies, how did you get that thing to happen? What was the ripple effect or why was it significant for that, you know, person or organization or place? And sometimes that, that next step of helping us understand, like, what did your footprint look like? It's, you know, you don't necessarily have that same space in the resume. Um, I would also say sometimes <clears throat> in the um, essays, right? Sometimes you yeah. might refer to something. Yeah. But um, Stephanie, do you remember workshopping the wording for these optional questions? Uh, just like yes. how precise we were trying to be to make sure it was clear. Um, I think for the folks out there, even letting you know what the historical, like how these questions were born might be helpful and um, how to understand them. So in the past, so we've had the what matters most to you and why essay for a really long time. Um, and over time, we we're finding that people were trying to put um, accomplishments. All accomplishments. They were stuffing accomplishments. Yeah. And it's definitely yeah. worth being proud of. And we definitely want to learn about them. But it didn't, right? It didn't always fit with the flow of what they were talking about as mattering. Or it made essays right. seem like here's what matters and here's evidence versus yes, the why. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, let me explain why. And, and while it is important for you to explain why something matters, it doesn't need to be like, I did X, Y, and Z, and that's why. <laughs> yeah, so that's where the, um, the genesis of these optional questions came into play. This allows you to both answer kind of to the fullest and however you want in any of those other spaces, and then still have dedicated space to allow that like, give us those kind of how, why, what of the accomplishments you've had. Um, and that's why there's three as well. Like they don't always have to be connected. Sometimes mm -hmm. accomplishments come in many different parts of your life. There doesn't even have to be a reference to them anywhere else in the um, mm -hmm. application. Um, each of those can be standalone or they can be used to um, kind of give more depth somewhere else. Um, so yeah. that is a very long winded way of saying, use it in a way that feels right for you. Yeah, and I like, I, I think it is important to reiterate that <clears throat> what we genuinely are looking for and the what matters most and why is to find out who you are as a person and what is most meaningful for you. And we want you to go deep in a way that allows you to share those reasons. Uh, and we want you to take maybe some of this other stuff, which you may have put in there because you felt like you still wanted to share those stories, which we value as well. But now you have another space to put those. And so that's the intent of the impact um, essay or the impact short answers. And I would say that um, as Will shared, like they don't have to be intertwined. They can be three disparate and that's probably typical. I would even say, um, don't try to fill the space if you don't genuinely have something significant to share. You may have already conveyed what you needed to. You can do too strong. You could have one strong one that really speaks to um, a way in which you've been impactful. So we don't want you to water down by also trying to just give us all three if you feel that you can share um, impact more succinctly in one or two. So, I, I, ooh, I'm loving this. I'm loving these questions in the Q and A box. So we're already like, we're already deviating from our script. This is way more fun. <laughs> this is way more fun. Um, so Suradeep is asking about how do we convey intellectual vitality and leadership in what matters most. Um, there's going to be some myth busting here, and I think that's why this one made me light up. Alums have said this essay must be from heartfelt, must be from somewhere heartfelt and vulnerable. I wonder how to talk about intellect and leadership here. 
I think this is such a fascinating question because you're understanding both, hey, what are the things that the GSB is looking for? How can I be thoughtful about what I'm writing? <clears throat> and like, how do I balance like, like all of the, the advice and different things that I'm hearing? And, and of course that myth busting element. So um, Stephanie, can, let's, let's talk a little bit about the essays, right? Um, how do they fit in with the greater picture of the application? What makes a quote unquote, well, let's say, let's say helpful essay as opposed to a good or bad, because even mm -hmm. shifting our mind frame about how we use the essays might help people uh, feel more comfortable with what they're writing. Um, awesome. And then let's unpack this, like the necessity of it being um, heartfelt and vulnerable. Like mm. that has a lot, that that's has a heavy. lot. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's deep. Um, we want you to be um, introspective. We want to hear your authentic voice. So these, those things are important. Um, the best way to describe the essay and how it can most um, effectively convey who you are is to have someone who knows you really, really well read your essay and make sure it sounds like you and authentically you. I don't know that it necessarily has to be vulnerable. You do not have to, you know, we do those talk sessions. And if there's anything I've learned from the talk, um, and it, for those of you on the line, if you're unaware, um, this is a really sort of a GSB tradition of students sharing a story with their classmates that might also be very heartfelt and vulnerable. That's where you're starting to see those elements come in. And um, I have heard them say in the coaching of that, that we, you can share as much as you're comfortable with, without going to a level that puts you in a, you know, a, a position that really um, can be difficult for you, right? So it's about sort of understanding the, the learning part or, or stepping up from what you learned from the experience. So I guess, um, as I see this, I want you to be authentic. I want to see your authentic voice um, and be genuine about it, who it is, and it should it should speak to you. But it it you don't have to feel like you have to. Your heart has to bleed to get you know something on the paper that's going to be, um, as you said, helpful for us. Uh, it, yeah. I don't know how to share that. That it's. It might be a really funny thing. It might be something that's like just really fun and important, but it is who you are as a person, right? And so that I feel like needs to be part. It does not have to be this, like, I found myself in the depths of, so, you know, I don't know how to describe, but it's, you know, how do you want to say that? Well, I know you've yeah. seen a lot of these essays too, to know yeah. the heart they come piece. in all different shapes and colors. Exactly. And that heartfelt piece, like you said, that's you, right? talking about the things that are important to you. That's th that piece. And then the vulnerable element, I define that very broadly. Being vulnerable means sharing, can be mean, sharing something that's meaningful for you. Sometimes it's the things that you care the most about. That's when you feel the most vulnerable when you're putting it out there because you don't know how the world may or may not kind of react to it. And so I, I would say, don't always think vulnerable as um, mm -hmm. a place of uh, fear or um, you know, something you're hiding, but vulnerable in sharing something that's important to you. And it, that can be a realization from you know, something more um, personal, or it could be something that you, you talk about every day, right? It's that feeling that you have connected to it. And then in terms of the intellectual vitality and leadership, I don't think you need to strategize too much about it. This, that question in particular is more about that self-reflection element. Uh, Dean Moss talks a lot about the, the body of research that say some of the most successful leaders are the ones who lead from a place of mission and values. And mm -hmm. this is a way for you to start um, discovering those and letting us know what are some of yours and what are some of your motivations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, you know, I do think it is something I used to share when I would be on the road that, <clears throat> 
if you if you do your essay well, or if you really spend the time to focus on it, it, it is likely something that's so core to the person that you are, to you as a being, that it's a theme that resonates throughout your life. And, and you know, this individual um, mentioned that they had heard from alums. And what I do hear from alums and students is that if, um, if done well, it's the kind of essay that if you read it 10 years post GSB, yeah. the, the common denominator, that theme still resonates for the person that you are, right? And it's the way that you make decisions, whether you know it or not, right? So when, when faced with a decision where you can go in two directions, your core is what makes you decide to go one way or the other. And those are the kind of things that, um, you know, we hope to kind of hear about whatever that might be for you. But yeah, the thing that that follows you throughout your life and is the essence of the person that you are. Yeah, I've heard of alums who when faced with life choices, maybe it's career, maybe life moves, they've gone back to that essay. So yes. okay, what was driving me? What still resonates? Like, how am I going to use that going forward? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to lie. I use it <laughs> as I was writing cover letters to be like, this is why I'm making this decision. So even yeah. beyond the application, you can yeah. use what you learn from this question. Right. It's like an almost every decision, you know, for me, as I shared previously, this, um, value of curiosity and, and wanting to learn and explore like when faced with a decision I'm always going to try to go with the like let's let's go out and see that or travel and, and understand and, and and just be more curious so that too is all about yeah yeah and a couple more questions while we're still on this topic of essays and then we'll we, we'll get around to a couple others from different parts of the application um, there's a question here from Chi Feng about like, how do you feel when you read a great What Matters Most essay? Like, what, what are some of the things that make those stand out to you? Hmm. When, I, I think it is when I feel like um, at the end of the essay that I can say to myself, okay, I, I, I understand a little bit more who this person is. Now, you're, this is your application. This by no means um, demonstrates the person you are. <laughs> There's so much more to you than what you can put in the application, but it gives us a piece and a, a little bit of a window into um, who you are as a person. So it, that's a very vague way to answer. But for me, that's if, if I come out of that knowing, huh, okay, now I get, because um, I think the rest of the application really does give you an opportunity to describe what you've done and the impact that you've had, things that definitely um, you've had some control of. And then this allows you to really elaborate on you as a person, so. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's how, um, even if you're writing the same thing as a ton of other people when it's your interpretation of it and its effect on you and who you are like that all immediately sets it apart um so and i don't think there's any topic that is used too commonly because mm -hmm. the way that people interpret it is always going to be different and uh, so celebrate the one that you kind of are feeling embrace that one um yeah. and i think sometimes the hardest thing to tell people is like giving them the power to do because they're like, oh, now I can go in so many directions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as you're leading, you're going to be having to choose through <laughs> different opportunity sets, different choices. I think this is a fun way for you to start playing around in that um, area and experimenting to find out how you decide. Um, so that's kind of this like unintended ripple effect of, of this application process, which is also why I love our like our questions are open but meaningful. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it, it you know, leaders come in in all shapes and sizes too, and we're not just admitting someone with a you know specific leadership style. People um, have all kinds of leadership styles, and they can be valuable in many different ways. And so, yeah, this is one of those things where in the essay you have the um, liberty to talk about. Um, how you how you make decisions, how something would, you know, how much you value a particular thing and how that would impact 
uh, the decisions that you make in your life. Yeah. Here's a question from Sika. So we've talked a lot about kind of the essays, the story, how the pieces connect, like how should I balance the detail of resume <laughs> versus, you know, impact, you know, how do these, what types of information can I share where that give you those levels and bits of evidence that really clarify that picture. But what happens if you're not sure what that end goal is just yet? Um, so the question itself, how can applicants who don't know exactly what path they want to take after business school, but rather want to use business school as an opportunity to explore and really understand the different pathways and options? Like, how do you show that effectively in an application without appearing confused? Uh, any mm -hmm. examples of how previous applicants have done this successfully? Hmm. That's, that's a great question. Um, I think I, I don't want people to feel like they have to have it all figured out by any means. In fact, even though you have the opportunity to share some of your aspirations and career goals and why Stanford would be a good fit, we don't hold you to what you write and why Stanford. You know, it's, it's an element that's important for us to hear about what are the things that you're, you know, ascribing to, but um, we certainly, and if you're part of the Stanford ethos and community, it is all about um, learning and keeping an open mind and discovering new things and having the support of the community to help you think through that. So to some extent, it should be a two-year exploration or journey for individuals. And it doesn't have to be. You might come in and be like, I know I want to go from X to Y and I'm pivoting or I'm staying in the same career path, but I see the business um, education as a way to get me there. That's that's great too. But I think there's certainly some uh, liberties here for people to really use the two years to um, think about what's next for them. Um, we don't often get an opportunity to take a step back and reflect, and that's what the uh, MBA program allows you to do. You know, if you're lockstep in your career and if been doing what you thought was appropriate. This is the time in your life where you can really think about what that next step looks like. So um, I'm looking at it just to make sure um, how can you effectively without looking confused. I think one thing that's important is if you are sharing something that's really, let, let's say, for example, you have a passion for getting into media. And um, that is where you want to see yourself go. If there's no evidence that you even dabbled in that space prior to coming to business school, we may question like, oh, why hasn't that come up? Whether it was you tried to get involved in some organization when you were an undergrad or even postgrad, or that perhaps you had an externship and you enabled yourself to do it in a space where you could kind of explore that. Um, it's it is helpful to see some element if it's that if it is a passion of yours uh, that you want to pursue that there's some evidence that you've explored a little bit about that before getting to the business school. I don't know, that's my thought. I might just actually question if I don't see enough that shows me. Yeah, sometimes that kind of exploration might be in your essays too, right? Because not everybody might have had the opportunity to like dabble in the world of VC, but yeah. what is it about venture capital that might speak to you, right? So even if it's in your what matters or somewhere to let us know, oh, where does this interest come into play? How does this fit in? So. I actually think, Sika, you might be underestimating that how much of a direction you might already have. I think exploration in and of itself is totally valid and a, like a really relevant reason to go to business school, right? Stephanie just yes. talked about it's baked into the program pretty much. Like, I think like 70, 75% of our students do at least one pivot in yeah. some way, shape or form. And there must be something you're interested in exploring. Maybe it's a field, maybe it is a role, maybe it is an impact that you're looking to make. So even as you're thinking about exploration and the different options, there are gonna be ways for you to narrow that down into something that feels bite-sized, 
right? Mm -hmm. The only people or well, the only person you need to convince that this is a valid reason to go to business school is you. you. And so a couple ways for you to maybe think through, all right, um, what could that be for me? And even if it's an open-ended, like it's open-ended in like that direction, um, this feels weird plugging one of our uh, other events, but in <laughs> sharing your story one, starting your story, I actually like walk folks through a couple of different exercises to help get those juices, those creative juices going. Yeah. Um, one of the questions you might be able to ask yourself is if there was anything that you could do, no like preconceived notions of what success was like, um, no fear of failure, anything that you want to do, what would it be? Do some brainstorming, do some free writing, talk to people about that. And you might be surprised at how much focus you might already have or how much kind of dimension and interest and meat you can add to that exploration element. So definitely ways to do it. And you probably already know more than you think you do. Yeah. And what I do love, that's so well said, well, I, I, I hope that people take that to heart. Um, what I do love about the community at the GSB is that if you are doing that exploration, um, you're going to be surrounded by people who, instead of telling you why it can't be done or questioning, they're really going to be open up to tell me more about that and how can I help support you and really allowing you to dig into that and, and, and find out if it's something worth pursuing or not as well. You know, you might have a number of different hypotheses that you test during your two years. Yeah. So we have about seven minutes remaining. Stephanie, okay. I think we can actually do like a lightning round of Ooh, what, okay. what's remaining. So <laughs> let's do that. And then we can close with any final words of advice we have. So um, would you view candidates with 14 years? How do you view um, candidates with 14 years of work experience? With someone who has a lot of experience we're sharing, um, we certainly value the perspective that you could bring to the classroom, given the um, experience you've had. And we see that as a value add in the classroom to be able to bring that perspective. Yeah, and it's not about how long you've worked, but what have you done during that time? Number of years of work experience, age, those are not parts of our evaluation process. It's more about like, what footprints have you left behind? Yeah, yeah. All right, next one. Any practical suggestions on how to solve when seems sound banal when put together, even though the individual incidences are unique. So how to tie things together. I'll take this one first, Stephanie. Yeah. So even it, <laughs> plugging another event, yesterday sharing your story too, writing in the application, we did a what matters most to you and why kind of thought exercise. So we did a quick version there. There is also already a posted a more extended version of that workshop that we did that I did earlier in the year. So definitely check out our Stanford GSB YouTube channel. There are going to be a bunch of videos there. We're really working on building out the number of resources that you all can use to help guide you through this process. We want everybody to know that, yes, you can do this. Here are tools to help you put your best foot forward. All right, let's see. Um, Understanding the parts of the application is like the process is holistic. Are there certain parts that you feel applicants tend to overlook in terms of importance to the broader evaluation process? Uh, no, I don't think there's a general theme. I think no, I no, would yeah, same. No, no general theme. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question. Um, nowadays, it seems that it has become fashion to mention social impact and NGO work. Uh, that the goal. That's the goal behind uh, pursuing an MBA. How do we as the admissions committee distinguish true motivation behind students applying to the MBA program? Okay, so that might not be so much of a lightning round type question. <laughs> mm, yeah, right. Um, well, we hope that when you are sharing whatever it is that's important to you, that it is, you know, part of the application is I, I agree that everything in here is um, a, as uh, authentic as possible. And so, no, you do not have to fit a mold of having any desire for social impact necessarily, but what is important is that you are authentically sharing the values that are important to you. Yeah. If nonprofit, if NGO, if social impact is not what drives you, 
don't you don't have to I am not looking for someone who wants to do that necessarily there's another question in the Q&A box like do I have to want to change the world no that, that that's not at all something that we're looking as like a necessity this is about like how do you want to almost like even think about changing your life right going to business school is going to help you look at the world through different lenses so changes can be small yeah. and meaningful so but that's mm-hmm. going to depend on you and what your priorities and your values are. So don't ch- listen to the chatter, center yourself. We are look and you're going to be the most effective and compelling when you're talking about the things that you care about. Yes. And so. here's one more question and maybe we can close on this and then go into um, advice. Okay. Uh, how do we view failure? I think there's might be actually a couple different questions here about failure. Um, let me make sure I'm getting it properly. Is it something you find it hard to understand? What the experience would have been like? Like, what do you say? How would we advise? Oh yeah, and, and someone else said, can applicants talk about their failures? How yes. Do they it positively. So I think it's absolutely, you can talk about a failure. I, you know, um, entrepreneurs will say, fail, fail often to succeed sooner. Or so there, there's um, value in what you learn from the failure, right? So I think the failure itself can can feel like just that, but it's actually what your outcome is as a result of the failure. Like, do you use that as something that impedes you going forward that you have the fear of not being able to overcome or has the failure itself taught you to look at things in a different way and overcome those challenges. So uh, I I think failure is a natural part of life um, and actually is a framework and fabric of who you are as a person, like how you've grown and that's very meaningful. And so take those as opportunities to convey what you've learned. That's, That's what I would say. All right, and Stephanie, people have heard from me enough throughout the week any final parting words, words of wisdom, words of encouragement that you can share with a, with everybody who has shared time with us today? Oh, sure. I mean, <laughs> I think at a very high level, you know, there's some anxiety and um, fear or concern about, oh my gosh, should I even apply? Like the the you know acceptance rate is so low, I couldn't possibly get in. And I would just say that a hundred percent sure where far away of not getting in is not to apply. So the most encouraging advice I can give to everyone is just to put your foot forward. Um, that that is going to give you the best opportunity to for us to learn about you. And so I encourage everyone on the line to take that leap of faith, to believe in yourself, to put your best foot forward and apply. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Stephanie, thank you for letting me pick your brains, chit chat about <laughs> a profession and job that we love and being able to support folks through it is just the most amazing feeling. So thank you. Thank you, everybody out there. I hope to cross paths with you again soon. Until then, stay safe.